So uh, you may know that uh, as we entered into this year, I asked the question, what is the foundation of all happiness? The classic question, and the Buddha's answer to this, along with certainly many other great teachers, and including folks in, in the secular traditions uh, around the world, um, his teaching is that a necessary, not sufficient, but a necessary foundation of lasting happiness is personal virtuous conduct, personal ethics, restraint, morality, virtuous conduct, as I summarized it. And so I launched into a discussion the last three weeks about virtuous conduct, first in the kind of immediate uh, arena of our everyday life, second, with regard to the broad theme of not harming others, including not passing along our costs to them, with particular reference to global warming and uh, the climate crisis. Then last week, I took a big breath, and I talked about virtuous conduct with during a time of plague, particularly with reference to whatever our personal choices might be about not harming ourselves, what it is like and what's involved with really paying attention to the kind of actions or inactions that um, can reduce harms to others. And we recorded all that. You can see the notes for those talks that are very detailed. I, I wrote them up quite carefully because I knew it would be controversial. And you can see the links to those that I've put into the chat. And um, others, if you could help me here a bit, might repaste those links in the latest chat, uh, you know, because it kind of changes from the bottom up. Okay, tonight I want to finish all this with an inquiry into what is virtuous conduct at the level of groups? Families, communities, companies, villages, states, countries, or even the whole human tribe together. And I want to explore with you uh, what I think are necessary conditions for healthy self-governance, politics, broadly stated. How do we make decisions as the whole human tribe about um, you know, resources, who, who gets them and who doesn't? And how do we how do we conduct ourselves in our relationship as a species with the planet altogether? This might seem way abstract, et cetera. It actually is very down to earth. And I'll talk about things that you'll immediately recognize. They will transcend partisan politics because I'm really interested basically in what happened over the last 10,000 years. Why is it actually deep down? What are the fundamental causes? What are the fundamental enabling conditions that have led the last 10,000 years, including in the present time, to be relatively sweet for the few and not very good for the many, including in the world today? What, what, what are the causes of that? So I want to share with you a kind of a teaching and a piece of writing that I've done. Um, it's available in the chat sidebar. You can see the link to it. And then I'm going to open it up to a discussion. I really encourage you to reflect on this in terms of what are the water, what's, what are the waters that we swim in? It's really easy to not notice a whole set of assumptions about how things operate, how countries operate, how organizations operate that actually are not inherent, really, and are a radical departure from the ways in which our hunter-gatherer ancestors and their hominid ancestors lived and governed themselves for most of the last 300,000 years of the life of our species and for the last several million years before that. So strap on your seatbelts. Uh, See what you make of all this. Here we go. How in the world can we have virtuous conduct at the level of groups from families to nations and the human tribe altogether? Caught up in the daily now, it's easy to forget that we are each a living museum containing the solutions to harsh survival problems faced by our ancestors. Primates emerged around 60 million years ago tool manufacturing hominids around two and a half million years ago, and anatomically modern people nearly 300,000 years ago. For more than 99% of this time, our great-great 
great, great, etc., great, great, great grandparents lived in small hunter-gatherer pans, bands. And a typical human band had around 50 or so members, many of them children. As the brain has tripled in volume over the last several million years, a major driver of its evolution has been the selective advantages of growing social capabilities. This is the social brain theory of modern scientists, the selective advantages of growing social capabilities such as empathy, bonding, language, compassion, and cooperative planning. Politics, to use that terrible and loaded word, bear with me, please. Politics, broadly, is about decision-making, sharing resources, regulating power, and collective action. That's what politics is really about. You find politics at all levels, including in families, companies, and countries. Bands, hunter-gatherer bands, that were a little bit better at politics, at working together in tough conditions, were a little more likely to pass on their genes. The capabilities and inclinations, therefore, that promoted effective politics in the social setting of small bands were gradually woven into our own brains. As Paul Gilbert and other great scholars have shown, our ancestors in hunter-gatherer bands evolved a way of living together that was organized around caring and sharing, as Paul puts it, which is a remarkable departure from the holding and controlling strategies of most other primate species. Slow it down. Humans are really different in how they organize their social life at the level of bands from our nearest relatives, the chimpanzees, the bonobos, orangutans, uh, gorillas, and other primate species as well. Now, the primal impulse, of course, towards self-centered domination still found expression in our hunter-gatherer ancestors in frequently violent competition for scarce resources with other bands, to be sure. But inside the band, inside the band, the foundation of healthy human politics, a politics for the common good emerged naturally from three conditions inherent in hunter-gatherer life. So just imagine yourself living together your whole life with several dozen people. With a little bit of contact, maybe with friendly bands around the edges, and some fearful and aggressive contact with many, many other small bands that were competing with your band for scarce resources, sometimes under starvation conditions. Imagine living your whole life with the same people, basically, 40 or 50 or people or so. What are the three objective conditions that are going to be present in, in those circumstances? Number one, common truth. Living in small groups, the facts were usually obvious. Did the hunt bring back food? Did the leader's plan work? Is someone eating more than their fair share? Is this person trustworthy or not? Common facts. You know, you can hide the, you can hide the chalupa, as it were, um, you know, for a day or a year, but eventually the truth will out. Second condition, common welfare. Common welfare, sharing ties of both kinship and mutual dependence. What happened to some happened to all. The self-interest of leaders was tied concretely and immediately to the good of the group. Third, common justice. Leaders had to face the people they led each day, and they could not mistreat them with impunity. Yes, modern anthropological Anthropological investigations of hunter-gatherer bands in the world today or over the last several centuries during which time they've been studied, um, yes, have certainly found inequalities of wealth and power, but they're fairly flat. And uh, there are a lot of mechanisms whereby in small bands, you can hold leaders to account, including ultimately by just walking away or frankly, you know, slipping into their tent in the middle of the night and Whooping on, them, whooping on them a little bit to say, no, you really got to cut that out. Common justice. So we have these three conditions, right? Common truth, common welfare, and common justice. Humans are best able to govern themselves in some when the truth is readily apparent to all, the welfare of the few is tied to the welfare of the many, 
and leaders bear the consequences of their actions. This might seem numbingly obvious. And yet, if you look around the world today, do, are we governed on that basis, well, generally speaking? If you look past over the last 10,000 years in human history, have we been governed? Have the many been governed on the basis of common truth, common welfare, and common justice? No, not at all. Why? Today, nearly 8 billion people are spread across the planet, most of us living in ways that are vast departures from our ancient social template. The natural decision-making structure of our species involves about 40 adults. 40 adults. Imagine the current distribution, pushing 8 billion, the current distribution of humanity represented by 40 people, most of them relatively poor, some of them desperate, staring at each other across an internet campfire, trying to figure out what's best for our human tribe as a whole. As we seek the greater good in the 21st century, we must ask how we will solve our modern problems, such as great inequalities of wealth and power, with our Stone Age brains. Life in small human bands was not idyllic, certainly, but anthropological studies generally show that inequalities of power and resources were not extreme, certainly not when compared to those today. 8% today, of the world's people now hold 85% of its wealth. 8% of the human population in the world holds 85% of its wealth. In fact, eight people, eight individuals, they all happen to be men, eight individuals have as much combined wealth as half of the human race. That's the world in which we live today. In the United States, the top 1% of the population have more money than the bottom 90% in the United States of America. Political influence is linked closely to wealth and is similarly concentrated. In America, for instance, there are approximately 120 million households, 120 million Nonetheless, midway through 2015, for which there's data, almost half of the various donations to um, the presidential campaigns came from just 158 wealthy families. 158 families contributed about as much money to the various presidential campaigns as the other 120 million people. What has enabled the enormous inequalities in modern societies? How come it's like this? What happened? You'd think that with the great production of surpluses through agriculture, industrialization, and modern technology, there would be plenty to go around, and all would share in the wealth of the human tribe. But in fact, the opposite has occurred. Fostering terrible individual poverty and misery as well as many brutal conflicts between groups and nations. If we're interested in the Buddhist principle of sila, or the broad principle across so many traditions of virtuous conduct, if we're interested in not harming, if we're interested in fairness and truth-telling, we've got to be interested in what has gone so wrong over the last 10,000 years. It's not an historic question. It's here and now in the headlines today. It's in the world altogether. So if we care about not harming, and if we care about helping ourselves and others, the answers to the questions I'm posing are extremely personally relevant. What happened across the world? Who decided that living conditions should be rich for one person in a hundred, roughly, comfortable for another 10 or 20, and difficult to awful for everybody else in terms of the human population on this planet right now. These are complex questions with multiple answers, but key among them is this simple one. The conditions that fostered healthy human politics, healthy decision-making, 
healthy distribution of resources, the conditions that fostered healthy human politics, common truth, common welfare, and common justice were lost with the shift from hunting and gathering to farming and herding. Beginning around 10,000 years ago, mainly in the Middle East and then spreading throughout the world. The production of surpluses let leaders concentrate wealth in their own hands, which let them concentrate power as well by hiring warriors to enforce their dominance and hiring priests to justify it. The truth of deals struck behind closed doors could remain hidden in societies with thousands or millions of people. The hunger and the poverty of the many did not affect the meals and the welfare of the few. Protected by their walls and their guards, the 1% could escape the consequences for the 99% of their rule. And holding and controlling, which is Paul Gilbert's term for the strategy of group living um, and dominant structures and other primate species besides our own, um, and also it's a, historically a way of dealing with other groups that we're aggressively competitive with, that said, holding and controlling, which was not the strategy internally in hunter-gatherer bands, holding and controlling as a broad term was unleashed to become the basis of human governance for the next 10,000 years and the world in which we live today. <clears throat> Average living conditions have certainly improved in the past century. Still, Inequalities of wealth and power are generally, ballpark, as large today as in Bronze Age or medieval times, since truth, welfare, and justice continue to be uncommon in a variety of ways. For example, in terms of truth, in technically complex societies, high-impact actions are easily buried in the fine print. Truly fake news routinely spreads, spreads virally through social media. Journalists and scientists are attacked as enemies of the people. A wash in information in the digital age, the truth is often hard to find. So much for common truth. With regard to common welfare, over the past 30 years, the stagnant incomes of the world's middle class have not affected the meteoric rise in wealth of the top 1% in the world. What has happened to us, and I include myself among them as still a relatively prosperous person, but I'm not in that 1%. Um, what has happened to us has not happened to them. And what has happened to them in terms of welfare and wealth has definitely not happened to the rest of us. It's a plain fact. Last, in terms of justice, common justice, outside of democracies, Governing elites are rarely held to account. Think about the state of the world today and the halls of power outside of democracies. Dictatorships, authoritarian regimes of various kinds. Even in democracies, and functioning democracies encompass roughly 5% at best of the world's population. And even in democracies, functioning democracies, democracies in deed, not just in word, Leaders and legislators can usually avoid dealing with uh, fill in the fill-in-the-blank, wounded soldiers, people without health care, or impoverished children that are the results of their actions or inactions. They don't have to deal with it. For the rare leader who's actually held to account, that's the exception, doesn't, isn't it? Even in democracies, that proves the broader rule. Now, I want to be crystal clear. I'm not saying that all those with wealth and power have gained it unfairly. I'm not saying that. Um, personally, I was a registered libertarian for many years. You know, I have a deep respect for the marketplace and the importance of having opportunity to, you know, to, to earn your way. That's in part why I care so much about justice and paying attention to systems that advantage people who look like me through disadvantaging people who don't look like me because that's not a level playing field in which people can truly compete fairly and really have opportunities to really earn what they got. You know, I'm, I want to be really clear. I'm not launching a communist tirade. You know, lots of people with wealth and power have used it 
for the common good, sure. The wealthy benefactors, including in the Buddhist time, were really important in bringing many wonderful things into being. And certainly some wise and large-hearted leaders, some have made great contributions to humanity. This said, this said, what's the general tendency, the general trend? Wealth and power have been used routinely throughout history to hide the facts, to decouple private gains from public welfare, and to shield leaders from justice, all to gain even more wealth and power. I came of age politically in the 1960s, and I've seen in my lifetime the beginnings of a promising restoration of the three conditions of healthy human governance, how we govern ourselves. Technology and education have definitely increased access to facts, knowledge, and truth. Good news. In some countries, tax policy and business regulation have slowed the concentrations of capital. The gradual spread of democratization has increased the holding of leaders to account. We have been leaning in the right direction, and the greater sharing of truth, welfare, and justice has been beneficial, certainly during my lifetime, to many, many people around the world. And I'm not trying to diminish those positive developments. On the other hand, recently, including in my own country, America, we've seen a swing back in the other direction, including fundamentalist or authoritarian attacks on a free press and the notion of factuality, that there actually are facts uh, itself. We've also seen attempts, strong attempts, to separate the wealth of the few from the prosperity of the many, and we've seen a movement towards pseudo-democracies in which leaders can lie freely and enrich themselves and their cronies. Meanwhile, billions of people living live in crushing poverty as the planet gets hotter every day. That's the world today in which we live. We're at a crucial tipping point in the course of human history. Things could go either way. What can we do? For starters, we live in a time in which knowledge is increasingly distributed and democratized. And this could foster the same for wealth and power. Gathering around a fire in the small bands of our ancestors, the many could speak up and stand up to the few. These days, individuals can join together to do the same. And though our campfires look like social media, town hall get meetings, and the public square. Gathering around them in our own ways today, we can speak up and stand up for facts. We can speak up and stand up for the general welfare and for common justice. And we can call out and name, and in my view, frankly, shame, those who violate the basis of any healthy relationship. So fundamental that we teach this routinely to our children, and we expect it from people who work for us or work with us uh, or we work under. This fundamental basis of any effective relationship, which is to tell the truth, basically, and to play fair. Right? So we can speak up, and we can, in part of that speaking up, is to encourage others to speak up as well to stand with them as they speak up, and to invite them to speak up and stop sitting on the sidelines, actually, as um, you know, the fundamental structures of governance in their country are gradually slipped back to how it's been over the last 10,000 years. Also, this is a strong personal suggestion. Countless nonprofit organizations are also pursuing the common good, from neighborhood groups to multinational NGOs, non governmental organizations such as Amnesty International. Some of these nonprofits integrate science, mental health practices, and social policy, such as the Compassionate Mind Foundation and the Greater Good Science Center. I'm a senior fellow there at UC Berkeley. Wonderful organizations, and there are many others like them. Thousands, tens of thousands, probably millions of non-governmental organizations of various kinds around the world are doing vital work and imagine a world without their work. Nonetheless, strikingly, in general, they could work together a lot more effectively 
while profit-seeking companies compete in the marketplace. Often fiercely, at the political level, profit-seeking companies are shrewdly cooperative, right? They cooperate with each other. They combine their money and a lot of money to pay lobbyists, donate to political campaigns, and influence policy in corrupt ways. Meanwhile, pro-social organizations of all kinds are really nice to each other, kind of at the local level, get together for a barbecue or a party or some kind. They're friendly with each other, but they rarely pool their resources at the scale necessary to stand up to the forces of wealth and power. It's really remarkable. I've seen it directly in my involvement with nonprofits. They're very friendly, but they rarely you know, pool their resources toward a common goal that they all have a stake in, like global climate change, the empowerment of girls and women, or the promotion of democracy and civil society. They don't cooperate toward those aims that shape, or, or you know, and the, they, don't, they don't address the conditions that are the frame in which they operate and frankly put Band-Aids as best they can, virtuously. It's worth doing. Band-Aid is better than nothing, but we're putting Band-Aids on a lot of the casualties of a broader system that humanity has stumbled into since agriculture over the last 10,000 years. Right? Imagine the results of thousands, even millions of nonprofits committing 1%. 1% of their revenues each year, and thus hundreds of billions of dollars, maybe pushing toward trillions of dollars at the scale necessary really to compete, um, committing 1% of their revenues and hundreds of billions of dollars, if not more, each year for a generation, committing to a single and highly leveraged purpose, such as relentlessly exposing corruption, promoting true democracy, or protecting the rights of girls and women, or decarbonizing in a really massive, necessary scale. Imagine what would happen if everything from a local homeless shelter to the Ford Foundation and everything in between, Gates Foundation, pooled their resources together toward some common aim that would have the effect of helping to reestablish common truth, common welfare, and common justice, while also accomplishing a noble purpose along the way, such as having universal education for all children, including, certainly, in all the countries of the world, girls, young girls. So, finishing up here. The hunter-gatherer conditions that promoted a politics that served the many, not just the few, are no longer simply given to us today. We must create them. It's up to each one of us to forge a common truth, common welfare, and common justice in our immediate relationships and in the, the groups in which we operate, and to do those things that would encourage this at wider and wider scales. It will definitely not be easy. For most of the past 10,000 years, ordinary people had no chance, or next to no chance, against the elites and their soldiers. In the dictatorships of one kind or another, under one label or another, including that of pseudo-democracies, that still prevail in much of the world today, they still have little chance. But where there is genuine democracy to some extent, at least we have a decent chance. A decent chance. And it is up to us to use it. Okay. So I feel I have a really good prescription for what ails human society at the, in terms of the frame that shapes wealth and power. I wish I had better prescriptions to go along with that diagnosis in addition to the two I'd named, um, including the second one of nonprofit organizations banding together in a very focused way for a generation to accomplish a major tilting back toward a level playing field by the end of this century. Um, and I invite your own suggestions along these lines. Okay, so I want to open it up and I want to see what you make of all this in the comments. 
trying to keep focusing on your own practice and steering clear of controversies with other people. It could become quite a mess. Um, let's see here. I see wonderful observations from many people. And to be clear, I'm not an expert in this topic territory. So it's with some with, with real humility and a certain diffidence that I just offer it. See what you make of it. Judge it on its merits. You know, as the Buddha put it a long time ago, see for yourself. See for yourself what you think too. And there are probably lots of people who have more expertise than I do about some of the prescriptions that might help to restore common truth, welfare, and justice at a broader scale around the world. Okay. I see your comments. I see your questions. Appreciate your comments. Great. Great. So many things. I appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> One thing that you might think about that served me as I scroll through this, down at the level of, you know, personal personal life. First, most people, certainly in the last 10,000 years, have lived under one authoritarian thumb or another. And still, and still not diminishing the consequences of the concentrations of wealth and power that were the frame of their lives, they managed to have lives that, that mattered to them. They managed to raise their children. They managed to plant trees. They managed to appreciate the sunrise. They managed to engage in some form of psycho-spiritual practice. Um, they managed to, in the setting in which they were, to, to do the good they could each day. That's available to us. It's helpful, though, to be aware of the larger conditions in which we're operating and not be blind to them or naive about them, but to take them into account. It would be like someone who lives in a very hot desert climate or someone who lives close to the North Pole. It would just be prudent to take into account the context, the conditions in which you live. Uh, it would be prudent to do that, including for your own happiness and your own welfare and that of others. So I think it's actually helpful to look at the conditions of public life and the allocation and how policies are made or not made where you are, because it's helpful to orient to that and not just be oblivious to it. Second key point, um, in any kind of group environment, uh, you know, I've been on boards, I've been in organizations, we're in companies. Uh, key questions, kind of simple. Uh, is there transparency, appropriate transparency? Is what is happening actually available to everybody appropriately given the, the organization, the corporation, the city government, uh, the national government, uh, you know, the international order, the banking systems? What level of transparency is really appropriate compared to what's actually happening? Because I think that common truth is the foundation of common welfare and common justice. And we can push for more sunlight, more daylight, and shine a bright light on people who swerve away from answering direct, clear questions. So two offerings there. Well, let's see, anything else floating around in the uh, chat? Do to do. Great, wonderful suggestions, wonderful suggestions, great stuff. I see a hand, okay. So Catherine, great, I'm gonna unmute you. Thanks for the, thanks Carol for letting me know that. And Carol, Catherine, I'm gonna ask you to unmute. We've spoken in the past, so I'm looking forward to this. All right, and as you know, the usual short and sweet, focused on our topics, great, go for it. Yeah, I just, I just want to say I'm glad we're having this level of conversation too, because it's on everyone's minds and um, yeah. or even in the background. And I, I studied uh, community economic development, uh, did a graduate diploma years ago, was involved with lots of activists and have had these conversations many times. So I don't pretend to have an answer, but I did want to share why I call myself River Rain, because it comes directly from the years of breaking my head about social changes and what I came to make peace with just to put as uh, 
The way I look at things, uh, we're all part of a great river of change and that we don't have control over. It's collective. And yeah. at the same time, every person is like the raindrop and has rings that impact. And so I chose to focus on raising awareness individually by helping individuals or by yeah. helping my immediate community because the globe is just it's just too big and i've been in community organizations too and it's so complex isn't it so yeah. i just wanted to share that little bit with <laughs> beautiful appreciate that very much i i very much relate okay. anything else So anybody, another hand, Kay, asking you to unmute. And by the way, I want to acknowledge um, that I think it is true that, you know, focusing on this and the larger context of well over 10 years, I think I've been leading a sitting group and talking about something different almost every week over those 10 years. I've rarely talked about the level of, let's say, social engagement, engaged Buddhism. So there's an important balance, I think, that's that's happening in this month on the one hand. On the other hand, there's certainly people for whom even this is just kind of too much. They don't really want it. And so I just kind of want to acknowledge that that is also the case, I think, for, for certainly some people. And I respect that. I get that. And, you know, they, in their mind, they don't they didn't come here to hear me talk about the last 10,000 years and, and how human governance has, has occurred. Uh, so I just want to say hello to you if that's how you feel and let you know that I really will return to a very, you know, kind of much more individual level focus uh, when I return in two weeks. Okay, so Kay, what's, and what's your comment or question? Um, yeah, I have a question. Can you hear me all right? Yep, great. Okay, great. Um, I really appreciate the topic tonight and um, um, I have a background in geology and history and, and so I, I I, I think about these big thing, these big questions that you're talking about. It concerns me a lot with the climate change yeah. issue, et cetera. And I really appreciate what you're saying about um, NGOs banding together and being more efficient. And I think if that could happen over, for the next 50 years or more, that would be great. But the question I have is, um, how do you, as a psychologist and expert meditator, how do you account for the outsized influence of sociopaths and psychopaths when we're talking about these imbalances of power? Because I think we're talking about people who, a lot of the people that are in the higher echelons that you're referring to, I, there's an outsized number of people in that group who simply lack conscience. Right. So how I, do, yeah. yeah mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, great. And a lot of people wonder about that. Uh, one, I think one way to think about it is to imagine a hunter-gatherer band with a narcissistic sociopath as the chief, as it were. Just, just imagine it. How long would that last? I've heard stories of Inuit tribes um, having rather stark tactics for personalities like those, like pushing someone off the ice and into the water and just leaving them behind. Yeah. And I'm not, yeah. And I'm, <laughs> but how, do we, how do we scale that up without having bloody revolution? Right. <laughs> well, right. So, okay. So that, but I think the key question a lot is what are the enabling conditions? That was where the, the Buddhist genius so much was to focus on what are the underlying causes and conditions, including the enabling causes and conditions. And, um, I think the problem is that when you start having concentrations of wealth, which then enable concentrations of power, which then foster even more concentrations of wealth in ways that are generational, right, generational, then you have opportunities for malignant, malignant narcissism to be very successful as, as, in, as a way to climb the slippery pole of wealth uh, and power and then use that position of dominance to perpetuate it, including against outgroups, 
outgroups of various kinds. So it's really the enabling conditions that are, that are the fundamental problem. And that's why I think the, the greater there is actual truth. What did, you know, what, what's the first thing an authoritarian leader does as soon as they take over? They start attacking the organs of truth telling. They take the TV station in some coup d'etat, you know, they attack the very notion of truth common truth. They, they attack journalists. They attack scientists. They start, you know, uh, inventing, you know, disinformation, misinformation, and all the rest of that. So that's the major attack. So for me, yeah, yeah, the, uh, there are many examples. The underlying opportunity is to really shore up. In my version of a perfect world, uh, every day Google on its homepage, which is visited by probably a billion people a day, would have the fact of the day. And it you know, it would be all kinds of facts of various kinds, but fundamental facts like uh, the fact that in America, one in five children lives below the poverty line. That's a fact or any other kinds of facts. My version of a perfect world, you know, a dozen benevolent billionaires would buy TV ads at the scale of 100 million a year, especially in local communities whose journalistic organs, the local paper and the local TV station are being bought up by right-wing ideologues who are anti-truth-telling, propagandists of various kinds, and by ads that are, you know, they play on common themes of, you know, of patriotism and banding together, and we need, we're all in this together, but also really communicate some fundamental information. That's part of my fantasy. So it's things like that, I think. So if there are any benevolent billionaires out there, send me an email. I'd love to talk to you more about this. Okay, well, anyway, well, thank you very much, Kay. I want to keep going. Okay, thanks. All right, I'm going to meet you. So David, and then Katie, oh my gosh, Julie, and then we're going to wrap up. So I'm going to be kind of quick here. So David, you're next. Hello, David. Good to see you. Uh, nice to see you. I am, uh, unfortunately, not a benevolent billionaire. Um, I am, though, a former investigative reporter and an executive director of nonprofits. Um, I, 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 I think I probably speak for a number of colleagues on this call that, you know, today's topic uh, was a, a really a, a tipping point, I think, in some ways, or I don't want to be overly dramatic, but I think it's yeah. really, really important what you just did. And um, my, I'll say my hat goes off to you. But, um, the, uh, the question I wanted to ask you, and obviously I'm putting it on the spot, but uh, feel free to, to turn me away. Um, what, uh, what's, what prompted this? Uh, and uh, how might that help us? If, it, if you're willing to talk about it, and I would respect if you'd say, David, um, politely, none of your business. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll be candid and brief. Uh, the larger interest around SELA, virtuous conduct, just seemed a little, seemed like a very important topic for me as a teacher. And I kind of wanted almost to do counter-programming. Usually when people at the start of the year, you know, it's all about good intentions, you know, possibility, wealth, power, you know, <laughs> bucket list. And I thought, nah, I'm going to bring it to, hey, where's your moral conduct on any given day, especially the footprints you're leaving on other people in terms, in, including the climate crisis as well, and also the current pandemic. So there was a little bit of uh, feisty, you know, pushback in me. With regard to what I talked about today, uh, I've just been, like so many people, heart sore. I, you know, basically I ask myself, what happened? I go back to the late 60s, the early 70s when I came of age, all kinds of positive developments, certainly in America and around the world. And yet in the last 30, 40 years, notwithstanding so many positive developments, including in the sphere of mental health and personal awareness, uh, We've seen, you know, greater wealth inequality in America and greater movement away from real democracy. What happened and what has happened over the last 10,000 years? Why has it been like Game of Thrones for most people throughout most of history? So that has really gripped me and that then led me to my insights, if you will, into the conditions of common truth, welfare, and, and justice that, cons that constrained our aggressive wolf of hate capabilities, which were released onto on other bands that we competed with who were unleashing their wolves of hate upon our band. So, okay. But internal to the band, the wolf of love was supported in really coming forward 
because of the conditions objectively of life in a small group that can't really possess very much, is living together, and whose faiths are really bound together. Uh, and what happened was that once we had surpluses, whatever those advantages were in having surpluses, those enabling conditions of healthy governance that we evolved to do optimally, optimal decision-making in a group environment is based on the constraints of common truth, welfare, and justice. When you blow up those constraints, optimal decision-making for the greater good just kaboom, goes out the window. The tough thing is how do you restore common truth, welfare, and justice with 8 billion people in the human tribe altogether by the end of the century? That's the question that grips me. I don't think I'll live to the end of the century. You know, I think my kids will. I think your grandchildren, their kids will, if they ever have any. And uh, you know, <laughs> that's what I'm hoping for, for all of us. So that's, that's what got me into this, David. Thank you. Okay, Katie and Julie, kind of briefly. All right, Katie. I'm asking you to unmute. You have to unmute yourself. Can you hear me? Yes, very good. Okay, thank you for a very interesting evening, to say the least. Um, you know, something, I'm a psychotherapist and a writer, and I'm pretty obsessed with these very important questions uh, myself right now. How do we change this uneven, uh, even cruel system? Uh, and what I'm obsessing about a lot is, let's say, for instance, and I wonder, Rick, if you'd comment on this, or if people would put references to books or things in the chat. Yeah. Um, let's say, for instance, we suddenly had a lot of town hall meetings everywhere, and all the nonprofits started to coagulate, and there was more cohesion amongst the people. Um, my thing that causes me to think about all the time is what I notice in myself and other people is there's still constant fragmentation within community. The fabric that we need to weave when we connect has to do with what you referred to as truth. Yeah. So it, rather than, let's say I'm at a town hall meeting and I'm sitting there judging people, I've shunned my neighbors, um, I, I feel ashamed to tell the truth. So my, I guess my question would come down to, um, is there anything that can be said about our individual responsibility in keeping the connectivity uh, in our daily lives? Because I caught myself not being honest twice today. Mm. I, I so appreciate it. I know we're wrapping up quickly here for those who are wanting to exit. And um, I so appreciate you bringing that up, Katie, because kind of swinging back to where we started three weeks ago, my first talk of the year, personal conduct, proper conduct, and, and um, unilateral virtue, I call it, that's not contingent on what happens around you, it takes into account what's happening around you and us can assert your own rights and needs appropriately and skillfully, but, you know, we're, we walk it ourselves. And, um, you know, I myself have concluded that there's not much opportunity with people who are committed, frankly, in a kind of cult-like way to a set of beliefs and a set of values that they're deeply invested in and they're not going to budge about, and they love to suck other people in to wasting their energy arguing with them. I'm, a, I'm very interested in the people who are sitting on the sidelines just trying to get through the day and are very disengaged and uninformed about simple, simple facts that just blow their mind when they, when they learn that certain things are really true. I'm very interested in those people, and I'm very interested in... Uh, frankly, nonprofit organizations uh, pooling resources toward a high impact purpose over a 30 year time scale. Because I think that's what it will take to really make a dent in the forces of wealth and power who are enormously self interested and very powerful. And at the highest levels, many of them are run by deeply selfish, if not sociopathically narcissistic people. So that's 
kind of my thing. All right. Well, thank you very much, Katie. Yeah, really. And a tip of the hat to you for walking your talk. You know. All right. Finishing up with Julie Dickey. Julie, I'm asking you to unmute. Um, thank you. Can I uh, keep my video? Yeah. Sure thing. No worries. Um, I just want to say, and maybe others have already said this, I, a retired social worker, want to be involved in everything. I'm just, yeah. I try to, but what happens then is I realize I'm not in my body. I am not yeah. centered. I am not practicing. And then I get so stressed out. And, but, you know, before I realize that, I'm hating all these people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> As the and, Buddha said a long time ago, good. don't let it invade your mind and remain. Exactly. Did you want to say more? I, I jumped into on, on you. No, it's just a dilemma that I constantly come up against. I, I go back, I meditate, I'm centered, you know, and then I yeah. go out in the world. And it just does not take long to, yeah, lose that. So, any. Yeah, I think there's a. I believe it's a Jewish proverb, better to light a single candle than to curse the darkness. You know, in other words, to focus on what we can do. And um, you know, a, a lesson for me is that, you know, I was in half a cult. I think of it as half a cult in my mid twenties. That's a whole other chapter of my life. And uh, one thing I've come to realize is that sometimes Throughout history, we've seen it, and we see it in countries today. People organize around a belief system and a sense of grievance that borders on delusional, really. But that's the formation of group identity. And often it's a kind of paranoid delusion, which involves unpleasant experiences. It's aversive to feel under threat or attack or to really feel like you're being continuously mistreated. It's, it's an unpleasant experience. It's not hedonically positive. Why would people seek to form a group identity around a sense of grievance that is, I think one can see, let's say when it's true, objectively is a fairly, is neither non-existent or is tiny compared to the very legitimate grievances of those others that this particular group scaled up even to 100 million people maybe in a country of 300 million, you know, uh, is being oppressed by them. So point being that one thing that's really striking is that we are very vulnerable to forming group identity around grievance, even delusional grievance. And I've just come to realize and recognize how impervious that group identification can be and how much time can be wasted trying to disrupt it with people who, in with other regards, are wonderful people. They raise their kids well. They teach school well. They'll play softball with you. They won't cheat at poker. They'll loan you money. They'll loan you their lawnmower. They're a good neighbor. But man, oh, man, oh, man, you get into that silo where they are in their kind of group identity space, nothing is going to happen, and you're just wasting your time. And so a lesson for me is just kind of clear-eyed recognition of that and allocating my, my energy and my emotional investment elsewhere. And that's been a personal, personal lesson for me. Hopefully that's relevant. Well, did you want to say one last little thing there and then we'll wrap up, Julie? I, it doesn't take, I, no, I, I learned, you do not argue with these people. They are in their silo. Yeah. But I'm just talking about, you know, reading the news or yeah. listening to the news yeah. or whatever. I just get so angry. Yeah. yeah, I'm with uh, one of the, the person who spoke earlier. I can't track her. I can't find her name where, you know, we're the drop of water. We keep doing what we can, right? Uh, rage, rage against the dying of the light. Light your candle. Pick your poem, uh, right? Okay. 